So hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox or CCAST. My name is Carly Jewell. I am a conservation biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the at-risk species coordinator for CCAST. And for anyone unfamiliar, CCAST is a platform to support peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and the co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges, such as introduced aquatic species. So CCAST supports different communities of practice, including the non-native aquatic species community of practice that we launched in May of 2020, 2020 excuse me. And if, if you would like more information on CCAST or our communities of practice, feel free to email myself um, Christy Miner or Matt Graybaugh, and we'll go ahead and drop, yeah, thank you, Christy, um, drop those emails in the chat here. And with that, I'll hand it over to Christy to talk a little bit more about today's webinar and introduce our guest speakers. Thanks, Carly. And hi, everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Christy Miner, and I'm the coordinator for the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice here at CCAST. Webinars like today's are one way that we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. Uh, so we're very excited today to host a presentation from Debbie Deshawn from Muscle Dogs and Matthew Barnes from Texas Tech University, who will talk about detecting zebra mussels using eDNA and detection dogs. Debbie is the owner and founder of Muscle Dogs and is passionate about animals and the environment. She holds a bachelor's degree in agricultural business and management from UC Davis and an associate's degree in exotic animal training and management from Moore Park College. She's been a canine handler since 1996 and a handler trainer since 2000. She also owns InterQuest Detection Canines of Central Valley, California since 1999. Matt is an associate professor in the Department of Natural Resources Management at Texas Tech University, where his research and teaching focus on aquatic ecology, management of biological invasions, and environmental DNA. Before arriving at Texas Tech in 2014, he earned his PhD from the University of Notre Dame and a BA degree in biology and sociology from Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas. All right, and then just a final reminder for folks, um, if you have questions during the presentation, go ahead and drop those into the chat box and we'll relay them to the speakers after the presentation is finished. So with that, um, Matt, I will hand it over to you. Okay, um, I make sure I can get my, there we go. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, Carly and Christy for the invitation to speak with you here today, the, the whole CCAST team and, and uh, everybody who's uh, um, in the room with us today. Um, I'll also acknowledge that the that uh, the uh, the work that I'm going to present, and then and then Debbie's going to take over, um, is a is a team effort. Um, and so uh, certainly, uh, 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 Ashley Whitehead is a master's student in my lab um, who just uh, is a was a former master's student, just finished her master's uh, about a week ago, um, and Caitlin Plate. Um, is a master's student who uh, should also successfully defend in about a week and a half from now. Um, so it was a whole team um, that put this together and, and excited to talk to you about um, our comparisons of environmental DNA and uh, detection canines for detecting invasive zebra mussels in Texas. Um, I am going to start with a broad introduction of environmental DNA and talk a little bit about uh, eDNA capabilities in Texas, and then I will um, pass it over to Debbie for the uh, the cute dog pictures and uh, and the real reason that you guys are probably all here. Um, and so uh, to, to introduce the topic of eDNA, I need to think back um, to my time as a PhD student at Notre Dame, um, and my first exposure to environmental DNA or eDNA came as we were studying invasive silver and big head carp in the Illinois River. And you can see from the photo on the screen now that one of the reasons that they are, uh, that these particular species are uh, of huge concern is that they get spooked by loud noises and, um, and launch themselves out of the water. And these fish also grow really large, sometimes reaching 100 pounds or more. And so if you're racing down the river 
in um, in in your boat and get hit by a flying carp, uh, there are cases where this could cause injury um, and and even death, where people have been knocked into the water and and drowned. Now, the 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 big headed carp that we were studying were located in the Illinois River, where they're actually more abundant than they are um, in their native range. Um, and and so in some sense, it, it's, it's a little surprising that we needed to develop um, uh, more sensitive detection tools uh, uh, for this fish that's, that's, that's huge, uh, quite conspicuous, literally jumping out of the water. Um, However, the picture that we see here is what is more indicative of, um, of what we might see uh, in, in the heart of its invaded range, um, where the species is well, where the species are well established um, and causing all kinds of impacts. Um, there's at the leading edge of the invasion front, the fish aren't as um, abundant as you see here and may actually be difficult to find, especially in systems like the Chicago area waterways for a variety of reasons related to um, water chemistry and ac accessibility, um, the shape of these canals that they are potentially occurring in and, and whether we can um, successfully apply traditional methods like trapping or um, electroshocking um, and, and, and other tried and true tools for, for fish collection. Um, and so with these fish swimming around though, um, ra rather than look for the fish themselves, we uh, realized that we could look for traces of fish in the environment. So, um, so think about uh, uh, CSI or one of your favorite crime shows where they go to the they go to the crime scene and they find the the glass uh, of water and they swab the rim of that glass and they use the DNA that they find on that glass to place the criminal at the crime scene. Um, and so really when we talk about eDNA, what we are talking about is um, our own little form of, um, of CSI that takes place out in the environment. And so broadly, when I refer to eDNA, environmental DNA, this is, um, I'll define it as genetic material that's collected from the environment, not through uh, uh, targeted methods. So we're not going out and looking for um, uh, uh, feces or, um, or parts of organisms, trapping organisms at all. Instead, we are um, grabbing bulk environmental samples things like soil. Um, we're going to talk about water samples today. I've got other projects where we've actually sampled um, dust from the air. Um, and, and, uh, and we can analyze the genetic information, the genetic traces in these samples to give us, again, clues about our, our criminals um, at the crime scene. Um, here is just a, a, a very recent review uh, that came out in Hydrobiologia maybe a week or two ago that shows that the, the use, the application of um, eDNA methods has been increasing um, very rapidly. So the, the uh, initial um, modern eDNA paper uh, is denoted by the star there in 2008. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, researchers and managers have been isolating DNA and genetic materials out of environmental samples for um, even longer than that. I'll point out just that the, the bluish color bar here um, is, uh, is uh, 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 related to this particular review and some other questions that they were asking, some filtering of the papers that they were doing. Um, and so, uh, so just here, we're just focusing on the, the height of these, of these bars and their apparent uh, um, exponential increase over time. Particularly important to this group here today is that eDNA, through these many studies that uh, that were captured in that review, eDNA analysis has emerged as a really sensitive and accurate tool for um, uh, detecting species and enabling uh, management. Um, and so here are just a collection of uh, management targets, including um, threatened and endangered species like the great crested newt in the UK. Um, that have benefited from, whose management has benefited from eDNA analysis. 
Um, and then particularly relevant, nice transition into our talk today, um, eDNA has emerged as an effective tool for the species detection enabling rapid uh, early, early detection and rapid response, EDRR, um, to invasive species management. I'm sure many of the people in the room here today recognize that often with these invasive species, um, uh, acting on their introduction uh, early is the only way that, uh, that eradication um, might be possible. So here we see uh, uh, the original uh, eDNA paper, uh, modern eDNA paper, uh, detecting American bullfrogs in um, French wetlands. Um, this uh, paper over on the right-hand side uh, shows some of our work um, on big-headed and silver carp um, using eDNA. Um, and then I'll transition into our focal species here today, the zebra mussel um, uh, in, in reservoirs of Texas. Now, um, these critters probably don't need much of an introduction um, because they're a poster child for, for uh, invasive species and, and impacts. They were likely uh, introduced, almost certainly introduced into the Great Lakes via ballast water um, release in the 1980s. They grow these amazing, um, so it's a, it's a small critter, right? About an inch long as an adult or so. They've got these microscopic uh, larvae, um, free swimming larvae that has probably contributed to their uh, rapid spread as well. Um, but what's really remarkable about these small critters is that they have the ability to grow these awesome colonies over really any hard surface as, uh, as shown here in this um, iconic image of a, <clears throat> of a discarded grocery cart um, colonized by these tiny mussels. The cart also helps uh, allude to the economic impact that these creatures have um, had because it costs millions or even billions of dollars annually to clean power plants, um, municipal water intakes, and other hard structures that these things grow on. Um, those hard structures can also include native mussels and uh, other hard native critters. And so this is a real concern, um, or this gives us one aspect of the concern about the impact of zebra mussels on biodiversity. Um, and then finally, zebra mussels are really voracious filter feeders and they can dramatically alter um, uh, uh, plankton and energy flows in the food web. Um, and then worse yet, they have this ability to uh, selectively graze um, uh, uh, material in the water, and they can avoid consuming harmful algae uh, or cyanobacteria um, while eliminating the competition from um, uh, more benign green algaes, which uh, can in turn lead to algae blooms or harmful uh, cyanobacterial blooms that affect, um, that further affect wildlife and, and human water, water use. So lots of concern about these um, critters. And um, and uh, uh, they first appeared in the great state of Texas in Lake Texoma um, on the Texas-Oklahoma uh, border. In, uh, they first were detected in, in 2009. Over the past decade or so, they've spread rapidly throughout the state. Um, this map even is a little bit outdated uh, uh, from about a year and a half ago now. Um, so unfortunately, this isn't even all of the uh, invaded um, uh, reservoirs that we have in the state. Uh, and, then, <clears throat> and then I'll point out too that we have our uh, our, our first uh, um, detection of uh, quagga mussels in the state um, uh, about uh, a year ago or so as well. Um, and uh, and and I won't talk about the quagga mussels today, but uh, but uh, similar kinds of concerns and, and impacts. So the appearance and spread of zebra mussels in Texas has led to uh, management responses like you see here that are focused on prevention, education and awareness um, uh, about invasive zebra mussels and their impacts. And today I'll talk to you about our, well, Debbie and I will talk to you about um, our efforts to quantify and compare the effectiveness of um, two methods for early detection and rapid response, canine scent detection and um, environmental DNA analysis. And I'll, uh, one really unique thing about what we're gonna talk about today that I'll, I'll point out and hopefully not steal too much of Debbie's thunder here is that 
While scent detection dogs have been used uh, quite successfully to inspect watercraft for um, adult mussels as they're entering or leaving the water, um, what we're going to focus on today is how well these, uh, both of these methods, uh, uh, scent detection canines and environmental DNA, are able to detect zebra mussel um, essence in the water, the stuff that you can't necessarily see with the naked eye, like veligers, their, uh, their uh, microscopic larvae, um, and other zebra mussel traces, their sloughed cells, mucus, um, and, and other debris that they might, uh, that these filter feeding organisms might shed into the, into the water. And so broadly today, we've got three uh, uh, major questions. Number one is whether we could train canines to detect this essence. Um, number two, focusing, we know that eDNA methods have been developed and applied to zebra mussel detection. So we wanted to um, specifically quantify limits of detection um, uh, of eDNA as well as uh, canine um, scent detection. Um, and then we'll end by comparing these two strategies. Um, I'm going to, in the last uh, five minutes here or so, just talk about, um, focus on the eDNA portion of the study, and then I'll hand it over to Debbie to talk about uh, our canines. Um, the work that we're focusing on here, or the work that we're presenting here today, took place in um, Central Texas, near San Antonio. Um, and for these uh, trials, we sampled water from a couple of positive um, lakes. I'll talk to you about uh, Canyon Lake, a reservoir in, uh, north of San Antonio, and Lake Placid. Um, that's just a little bit off screen here. Um, and, uh, and we used a couple of uh, negative lakes in the area as well to um, compare and, and, um, and test our ability to detect zebra mussels using eDNA and canine scent detection. Um, so uh, here is just a broad sort of setup about what our um, what our sample preparation is going to look like today. Um, we, and I say we again, this is graduate students Ashley and Caitlin, um, did a lot of plankton towing in these positive lakes um, to generate to uh, collect really uh, concentrated zebra mussel veliger samples. So lots of plankton plankton toes, followed by um, a lot of hours in front of the microscope using uh, cross-polarized microscopy, uh, uh, light cross-polarized light microscopy. Um, the the uh, zebra mussel veligers have a really distinct um, cross pattern uh, to them um, under, uh, under that light on the microscope. Um, and we created these concentrated, essentially what we did was we set up um, a concentrated veliger sample and then prepared serial dilutions from there um, to uh, an analyze and see how low could we go for uh, uh, eDNA detection of veligers in water and uh, scent dog detection of veligers in water. Um, this is also a really good uh, quick place to plug the fact that um, we did apply strict uh, bio biosafety measures throughout um, all of this effort uh, to avoid spreading zebra mussels ourselves. Um, so plankton nets were soaked in uh, vinegar for one hour, a uh, minimum of one hour following um, each use, uh, followed by a 10% so a soak in 10% bleach for 10 minutes, and then um, rinsed copiously and uh, dried overnight. Um, and then uh, all collections were uh, uh, done under the auspices of a Tex Parks and Wildlife, wildlife uh, Exotic Species Research Permit. Um, and then the dog work that uh, Debbie will talk about was um, uh, reviewed and approved by the Texas Tech Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. And so eDNA analysis, um, when I say eDNA analysis, what were we looking at here? Well, we were filtering, we collected um, uh, water and filtered that water through a uh, 47 millimeter uh, membrane disc filter with a pore size of one micron. Um, we used a, uh, a CTAB and chloroform based DNA extraction to extract total DNA from that um, off of that filter. So this is going to extract the DNA of zebra mussels as well as um, algae, other plankton that are on that uh, filter. If we captured, there's probably fish DNA as well as researcher DNA. 
um, on uh, that filter as well. So we end up after the DNA extraction with a tube full of DNA and we use species specific quantitative PCR um, to analyze, to uh, quantify the uh, zebra muscle DNA only. And the two numbers that I'm going to show you here today, um, trying to jump straight to the punchline and leave enough time for Debbie to talk. Um, I'm going to just, I'm going to, on the next slide, I'm going to show you, we quantify the limit of detection. So this is, um, this is an area. So when we run a PCR, we run replicate, uh, technical replicate reactions. Um, and the limit of detection is where at least one of any of those um, uh, technical replicates, pseudo replicates uh, per uh, sample were positive. And then we also uh, will present the limit of quantification. And that is the lowest uh, level where all three of the three technical replicates, pseudo replicates that we ran um, were, uh, were positive. And so jumping right to the punchline, um, we found our limit of detection. So this is the uh, concentration of villagers in a sample that we would expect um, to be able to uh, uh, have any positive detection um, at all occur was less than a villager per millimeter, milliliter of, uh, of original water. Um, our limit of quantification, so we could actually um, uh, quantify and say how much um, DNA is in our sample reliably was up around 26 villagers um, per milliliter. Um, and Debbie's going to show us some information on how those numbers compare to scent dog detection um, and a little bit of microscopy as well. And so um, the last objective of the study here today is that we wanted to compare the strengths and weaknesses of the two approaches, uh, scent detection dogs and, um, and uh, eDNA uh, sampling. And I will just point out that we, um, to do this portion of the study, here is a map of where our water samples came from. We went to a variety of reservoirs across the state of Texas, um, both known to be positive, with uh, uh, zebra mussels, as well as those that were suspected to be negative or at least unknown um, to, uh, to have zebra mussels um, in them. And um, we collected uh, three liters of netted water and three 500 milliliter uh, water, uh, grab water samples per site. The three liters of netted water were further concentrated down um, as previously described uh, for uh, scent dog um, analysis and, uh, and detection. And the three 500 milliliter samples were um, filtered uh, and then directly used for environmental DNA analysis. We also used a one milliliter aliquot of each of the concentrated plankton samples um, to uh, evaluate uh, uh, using microscopy. And so that is where I'm going to stop talking. I've got to be continued on here because I think I'm going to hand it over. I'm going to stop sharing and I will hand it over to Debbie, who will give the second half of this presentation. And then we uh, have agreed we'll do um, question. We'll save question and answers um, until the very end. Thanks, Matt. Debbie, your screen looks good. And if you're talking, we can't hear you, Debbie. I wasn't talking. I couldn't figure out how to unmute. Okay, gotcha. I'm here. Here you go. Thank you. Okay, I'm not gonna run my camera because my um, I'm in the middle of nowhere and I'm a little unstable as, well, I'm a little unstable, but also my internet's a little unstable. So um, we're just gonna 
not, you don't, you don't have to look at me through this. So um, as Matthew said, well, again, thank you for having me. As Matthew said, um, we worked as a wonderful collaboration on this. We were sponsored by the um, Fish and Wildlife Services. We got a grant. They were pretty excited because this was one of the first um, research grants they'd done, um, especially used, utilizing the dogs. So we were actually really proud to get this. Um, let's see. So just a little bit about me and Muscle Dogs. We um, established Muscle Dogs in 2008. Um, at that point, we had found out that Fish and Wild, California Department of Fish and Wildlife had um, trained their dogs to find the mussels. It was brand new in the West Coast. So we decided to go ahead and um, see about making a company about that. It actually took us two and a half years just to get a permit to get the mussels to train the dog. didn't have my first trained dog until 2010. Um, and during this whole time, I was going to all of the meetings, learning all about the muscles, um, you know, so that I would have a really good understanding of what we were looking for and um, best ways to accomplish that. Um, we got our very first paid two weekend gig at Lake Sonoma back in 2012. Um, today, actually there, we're actually there every day um, at uh, three of their ramps. Um, we, um, so it's, it's come a long way in the last 11 years. Um, in 2014, we were always, always being asked so that we know the dogs can find the muscles, can they find the villagers? So in 2014, we um, were able to put together a group with Dr. Um, um, Wong and California Department of Fish and Wildlife dogs. There were only four dogs at that point in the country trained to sniff for them. And we um, went and did a study and um, were able to determine that the dogs could find the villagers. Uh, that study was published in 2016 because I'm a dog person and don't know how to write a paper. So it eventually was published. Um, 2016, we also were um, honored to be awarded the Reduced Risk and in Invasive Species um, Collaboration Award for Innovation. So that was exciting. Um, all right, so that's a little about us. Um, so again, like I said, we know that the dogs can find the adult muscles um, and that we can look and be like, yeah, there are muscles here. But it's obviously less clear for the villagers. They're microscopic. Um, they, we can't see them. So how, how do we confirm if the dog alerts and we don't see adult muscles, how would we, you know, how can we really say that they're, that it, they're villagers there? There's, there's no on-site test for that or anything. So it's really important to do these studies to be saying, yes, even though we can't confirm it on site, this is definitely a boat that we want to take a little extra time with cleaning so that we are making sure they're not spelling the, uh, spreading the villagers. If there's water on this boat, we wanna mitigate that water. We wanna decon it if we can. And you know, this is definitely something we wanna do. So these studies with the dogs confirming that they can find the villagers, um, you know, and then obviously talking about the eDNA and, and all that as well, you know, is, is important. Um, uh, Matthew already went over this, what it is that we were the absolute most important part. Here's our team. We had, um, this was the age of them when they were working. Um, the, so they're obviously a little bit older now. Um, Captain, Gilligan and Marlin, we're gonna discuss this in a minute. So all the males actually were trained to sit. All the females were trained to focus. And I'm gonna explain in a minute why that's so important to understand. Um, this was the first time that a um, research project had been done like this where um, it was actual dogs that work in the field. So these dogs aren't research dogs. These dogs aren't just trained to do the research. So these are dogs that are out in the field sniffing boats. That's what they do for a living. So we are bringing these dogs into the actual research arena and we actually had to teach them how to take the test. 
And so this is, um, I'm gonna show you what we did. These um, boxes that you see here on the right are the olfactometer boxes. And what the dogs had to do is they had to stick their nose in the port and hold their nose. And that's how we knew um, if they were, were smelling the odor. So let's see if I can get my video to work. So here's Dory. Okay, so Dory holds her nose in the port. Um, she has uh, had to hold it for, um, it, well, I think we worked up to 30 seconds, but at this point it was shorter. And, and then it would tell her with that bloop that she was correct and then she would get her toy. So that's a focus dog. So here is poor Captain. Captain is a sitting dog. So when Captain smells the odor, he's taught to sit and he gets his, his toy. But, so you'll see. So he's showing us it's in there, but he's sitting, he's not holding his nose in the port. And so, so the sitting dogs got very frustrated. Um, so a lesson learned obviously in this is that we kind of need to train them to these olfactometer boxes first <laughs> um, so that they understand how to show us. So is Captain wrong? No, he's not wrong. He box it was in, but uh, in statistically he's incorrect because it would have, um, Okay, so here's the actual olfactometer box that we're talking about. And um, what's beautiful about these boxes is we have no control. Well, uh, as the handler, I don't know what's happening. I don't know, there's six ports in there. Um, one of the ports or two of the ports have odor in them. The rest have odor, you know, that's not target that we that the dog shouldn't hit on. and when a computer decides of those three boxes, which one has the target odor in it and which one doesn't. And clue what's happening as far as the boxes go, we don't know which one has the odor. So we can't be cueing our dogs in any way. And also it is very um, random as to whether it would be box one, box two, you know, that, that did the odor on any given time. Um, we've already gone over this about the water collection um, and the, the screening for the eDNA. So we'll get into some of our actual sessions. So here's the very first thing that we did is we um, um, did just the dogs with spiked spring water. So we had the villagers um, at a high concentration, we put them in spring water. And as you can see, the dogs were all very, very good at finding it there. Then what we did was we taught the dogs a negative control, which was we taught them to sniff each of the boxes and then to walk away. So not that was a learning curve for the dogs as well, because we had not trained that in the past. Um, you know, so that was something that we had to train them as well. And then what we did was we um, took filtered lake water. So now we have the lake water that has all of the nutrients, the, the photoplankton the, there, as well as the villagers that we put in there. So, so it, it's not just, okay, water, and this one is spring water, right? This one actually has all of those other things in there, plus the villagers. So had the lake water. So there were other odors in there. It wasn't just like a pure sample of nothing. Okay. Uh, after we did that, what we wanted full testing. So what we did was we, um, put, um, we started out with a certain amount and then we added um, what, when the dog hit that, then what we did was we decreased it by a third and we kept decreasing it. So, so one, one particular dog 
let's say they hit sample one and then we decrease it, they hit sample two, they decreased it, we hit sample three, um, they decreased it, sample four, they didn't hit. So then they would go back up to sample three. If the dog hit sample three, we'd go back down to sample four. If they hit sample four, then we go to sample five um, as we're decreasing. So we're trying to find the lowest threshold that each individual dog could find. Um, and uh, they had to, at the end, the way they determined it was they had to go back and forth three times. So if they hit sample four, didn't hit five, we went back to four, they hit it, went back to five, they didn't, went back to four, they hit it, went back to five, they didn't, then that's that's when we stopped and said, okay, level four is their threshold. So here are the results to that. It was very interesting. Again, remember we had three dogs who focused and three dogs who sat. So innately the dogs who sat did, did less well because even though they may have showed us it's in this port if they sat and didn't hold their nose in the port enough long enough then it was considered they didn't find it um so captain um found the least amount which was it was three 318 villagers per milliliter was his threshold but we go to moomba who was one of our focus dogs and she literally got down to a threshold of less than a villager per milliliter. So, so obviously the dogs are able to find, you know, there's going to, sure, gonna be differences between dogs and stuff, but I mean, less than a villager means at that point, the dog is probably, you know, possibly finding essence of muscles as well. So after we did all of that, we were not in dogs at this point, like dogs that are just finding high concentrations of plankton. We wanted to make sure that there were they were actually finding the villagers because we just had a concern at this point. So we went ahead and did some plankton control testing to make sure. And we, thank goodness, um, realized yes they are finding the villagers and it is not just that they're finding a nutrient rich um thing of water which was you know the whole really important whole whole purpose of that and then we went to the final where we were did the blind samples so the dogs weren't rewarded because we had no idea nobody knew what what lakes were positive or negative while we were running the dogs and um and so we didn't want to be rewarding them because you know you don't want to reward a dog unless you're 100 percent sure um so we did all this blind testing with the dogs and um the these are the samples and then also we had um the dna as well you know the what the dna said at these particular lakes and then here's here's a better way to actually see it. So interestingly, um, at at most of the positive lakes, um, the dogs um, the dogs and the DNA found positive results. We had one lake, Granger Lake, that that um, they say is positive, but we actually both had negative results. And you know that goes to show you that it could have to do with when you sample, where you sample, you know, there may not have been, and even though the lake is infested, there may not have been anything in that particular sample. So we do want, you know, you, it's important to sample in many areas as well. Um, Canyon was a lake that we used the water for a lot in the initial testing. So, and the dogs did show an interest. So maybe they were more familiar with it something we would possibly want to proof dogs off later. Um, possibly we need to use, you know, more um, non-infested lakes that we're training the dogs on originally. I mean, there were a lot of lessons learned in this, but what was good in the end is um, the fact that um, we learned a lot of good lessons and the, the dogs were more likely to err on the 
side of saying it's positive when it's not, then that is negative when it's not, which is important if we're talking about doing sampling, right? So if we're using, using the dogs as say a flashlight, like here's a hundred samples of water and we don't have the time, the money or what have you to like look under the microscope at these hundred samples. Let's let the dogs take a look and the dogs tell us, okay, these are the eight that are the most important for you to look at. So in summary, um, and we've kind of been over some of this, um, the dogs are, um, they're there, they're real time. You know, we are at the lake able to do it in real time, but they're obviously more error prone um, than the eDNA. Um, they have a relative low sensitivity. I mean, uh, not compared necessarily to DNA, let's eDNA, let's say, but in general compared to like a human, right? We're looking at the boat, we can't see anything. So their sensitivity is obviously a lot better than ours. Um, we did determine that if we were going to um, give people direction on how to collect samples that we would tell them to concentrate it. It just makes more sense. Uh, and it's, it's gonna be a better, the dogs are gonna be able to better judge it. Um, and as we um, adjusted to more stuff, the, the, the dog started really understanding. Um, as far, oh, sorry about that. Well, there we go. Um, as far as the DNA goes, um, it, it's, it's slower as far as results, immediate results. I mean, it's obviously less error prone. Um, uh, there's it's higher sensitivity and there's less need for sample concentration. But, but there's that whole time and money aspect um, that's the difference between you know, the, the dogs and the DNA. And in, in theory and best practices is we wanna use all the tools we have. We don't wanna say, hey, this tool is the only tool. If you don't use this, you know, you're not doing it right. We wanna have a ton of tools in our, in our tool chest and we want to be able to utilize them um, appropriately so that we get the you know results and answers that we need to get. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie and Matt. Um, yeah, very, very interesting work and really cool to see those results that you got. Um, we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, we got a couple questions. Um, the first one Matt, Matt answered in the chat, but I'm just gonna read it in case anyone else um, wants to know. Uh, so the question was, why do you think you got a lot of positive detection um, in the middle of Texas? And Matt says, Interstate Highway 35 runs north-south through Texas. Um, and aligns with the spread of zebra mussels. Uh, Matt, if you want to elaborate on that at all, go for it. Um, uh, yeah, not much to say there. I mean, I think the, the, the culprit for spreading zebra mussels across the state is uh, is very, very likely on, on trailer boats and equipment. And uh, so we've got a major corridor that runs through Dallas down uh, uh, towards Austin and San Antonio. And uh, it appears that the uh, zebra mussels are, uh, are uh, hitchhiking. Got it. That makes sense. Unfortunately. <laughs> um, all right. Another question um, is about how the dogs were paid for their job. Um, so the question is, so the blind sample, no reward runs were considered negative runs. Um, any reward after versus the reward for trained indication at the source? Yeah. And that so kind of we yeah, go for yeah. it. So, um, probably only the dog people on here are going to understand that question. So when the dog does something correctly, they they win their reward, which our reward was a ball. Um, and so, but in this case, we actually did train them to give us the negative response. So the dogs did get their reward for the negative response. So part of part of the training, while we, and it's nothing that these dogs had ever been trained to do in the past. Um, so part of our training was utilizing those boxes 
And then also another whole thing that we had to train was to give us that negative response and know that that was a good thing, right? We want you to, if there's nothing there, you want us to walk away and be like, there's nothing there. We are going to give you your toy because um, you did right. You did the right thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the dogs, just mostly out of curiosity. Um, do you think that the the individual dogs that did better, do you think that had to do with their training or more about their individual or breed ability to detect? I think yeah. I think there's definite individual. Uh, um, I I'm not a breed person, right? Um, if the dog's absolutely ball crazy, I, I, I don't care what you are. Um, Captain, the one who actually did the worst, you know, statistically did the worst is absolutely phenomenal. And so I, I mean, I truly believe that it had to do with the training and the dogs that, that were sitting um, and personality. So even Dory, who's one of the focused dogs, she, she didn't do as great as all of the other dogs because she got bored. It wasn't, it was just it, stick, sticking her nose in boxes was not her thing. And the, the reason I can really explain this to you is because statistically she didn't do nearly as good as Moomba. Her numbers were like in the 160s or something where Moomba's was less than one. But Dory found a cheat. Dory is the dog where we had started putting our samples in, I believe, plastic vials and the others were in glass vials. And Dory started cheating and just hitting the plastic vials every time. And so, so her ability, right, is as good as, most likely, as good as Moomba's. But in this case, in the test, she was like, oh, no, this is boring. Yeah. So does, if, does that make sense? And actually, just to, just to uh, make that feat a little bit more amazing, they were all glass vials. It, it had to do, um, some of them had, it, it was the lid. Uh, and the little in the liner that that made the lid uh, seal. Um, we had two wow. different lids for our different samples. So they uh, these uh, dogs are um, are really good at what they do. They're almost too smart. It sounds like <laughs> they can be. They can be. <laughs> That's great. Um, all right. Another question: How did you arrive at the vinegar bleach decontamination protocol for your zooplankton nets? And I think, uh, so I think that protocol uh, is actually slightly more strict than the Fish and Wildlife prescribed uh, protocol. This is, uh, we ran this by Texas Parks and Wildlife. So the thinking here is um, uh, the most important aspect of this uh, decontamination protocol is the, um, the vinegar. Uh, portion because the uh, the uh, uh, zebra mussels have a calcium carbonate shell and so that acid um, uh, essentially dissolves them. Um, bleach is uh, our tried and true method for um, DNA de decontamination to make sure that we're not introducing any DNA to any of the types of, uh, of samples that we might collect. And so the combination of um, vinegar and bleach uh, uh, just was sort of a double whammy. Um, and then as the, the, the I'm, I'm sure many of us are familiar with the clean, drain, dry um, uh, 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 mantra for, for managing zebra mussel um, invasion. So that overnight, that complete dry overnight is also um, uh, really important uh, and prescribed for, uh, for watercraft um, moving around. Um, but uh, but worked for our our nets as well. Awesome, that's great. And for what it's worth, I'll say that that uh, that combination did a real number on our nets. So by the time that um, that this uh, you know everything that we talked about here today was was done in in about a little less than one month, and over the course of that one month. Um, we went through several plankton nets and uh, even lost uh, the valuable uh, uh, plankton uh, cup at the end of one um, because it it uh, it it does a number on those nets and makes them real brittle um, over time. Gotcha. All right, um, those are helpful tips. Um, Debbie, this one's for you. Any tips for starting your dog on scent training at home? 
Yeah, first I'm going to kind of go back to what Matthew was just saying and and say, if we wanted to, if anybody out there wanted to do research with dogs, call me for tips those 30 days, right? Oh, because we lost you a little bit there for just a second. Am I back? Here, now you're back. Me, <laughs> okay, let me, let me turn the camera back off. Um, so um, if you wanted to use the dogs for research, I have tips for that as well, because there, there's definitely things we could have easily trained the dogs and not taken part of our precious 30 days working with the dogs on things like, you know, teaching them the blind or teaching them the olfactometer. I mean, they, they'd never done any of that. So, so I'd like to throw that out there. Um, for starting your own dog at home, I personally work off of with toys. You can work with food as well if you have a food motivated dog, but they do get full, right? So if you got a dog that you want working all day long, food to me is not the best, but you can start them with it if you want. I just playing a game of hide and seek is is basically you you find what your dog loves and start playing hide and seek with them or shell game with them. Put and that's that's a that's did I freeze again? That's the best way to do it is, is just play a big game of hide and seek and have them searching for their toy or their reward. And I mean, that's, that's how you're going to see if your dog even likes it. And then, you know, outside, do it at parks, do it in all different environments um, because they might do great in your living room and not, not give a hoot about it outside because, you know, there's, there's grass to eat or a tree to smell. That makes sense. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna. We got two more questions. I'm gonna jump to one since we're kind of on this topic um, about the dogs. Uh, given the findings for the dogs' indication, the focus versus sit, and the types of vial containers, would you consider rerunning the study to see if the results varied? One thing I'll say about that is that we. Um, we have uh, uh, checks built. We had checks built into the into each study, at least about the the types of vial containers. Um, after we would perform a trial where we were having the dogs um, discern between a positive and a negative, can they identify which which sample is positive? And um, especially if we got results that looked like yes, the dogs were doing it, um, we would follow up with the same the same trial only we took out all the positives we gave the dogs only negative um, samples to choose from and in that case we would expect that uh, they're given three choices um, uh, the three ports to stick their nose in um, we would expect that they would um, pick the right sample right with no odor about a third of the time because it's a one in three shot and so we had um we had those those trials built in so that we could do um we could catch those cheats right mumba was was uh, smelling the lids we could catch we could catch the cheats and then adjust our adjust our protocol so um yeah i think so uh, so one response here is that um i think we successfully built in those checks and um, that would be a recommendation for um future studying future studies as to is to build those checks in and and um, and uh, uh, make sure to account for that. I'll let Debbie talk about uh, whether indication method might deserve a little bit more study and what that might look like. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think rerunning the study would be great, but we would definitely do um, a bunch of pre pre study stuff. Um, I mean, you know, teaching to the test, it, you know, just teaching the dogs how to react correctly. Um, with the focus versus sit, one of the things that we did do towards the end of the study was we decided we were going to make the sitting dogs hold their nose a whole lot shorter amount of time than the focus dogs. And so we started getting better results for them there as well. And then if we just had a dog who just did not want to do that, we would just wash that dog and bring in a different dog. So I think, yes, um, it's not that you couldn't have a sitting dog do it, but you would you would certainly need to train them to understand what to do um, in, in this instance. 
so I, I, I mean, rerunning it would be great. It's just, of course, you know, if y'all want to pay for it, we're in. That's always the issue. <laughs> All right, um, this next question is a really good question. Um, can you correlate the test to real real world scenarios? That is, mm -hmm. how well would a dog perform when inspecting a wakeboard boat with villager laced water in yeah. a ballast tank? Perfect, thank you, this is great. So, um, so that's the whole point of doing this study is we're trying to say, is the dog gonna find it in the real world? And what I can tell you is that we have proof now that they can, because luckily for us, one of our clients is like Amistad in Del Rio, Texas. And since we've done this study, um, anytime we have a dog show an interest in a boat, they actually collect the water and send it to a lab to get verified for DNA or villagers. Actually, I think they just send it in for DNA, which, you know, is fine. Um, and so, um, and I believe to date, since we've done this study and they've been doing that, I believe seven of the eight samples that they've sent in have been positive. So the dogs are absolutely, and these are boats where, where there are no visual adult muscles on them, but when they had them pull their drain plug or they had them, you know, uh, looked inside their live wells, there was standing water. And so, absolutely. We did have one instance, um, a few years ago, we were working at Lake Tahoe. What we did was when we had the dogs walk the wakeboard boats, we would, as the dog was walking the wakeboard boat, we would have the boater turn on their pump um, their ballast pump so that that was pushing the air out, which would be pushing any odor out. And um, we did have one dog, um, we did have, and it was Captain, see, our lovely Captain boy. Um, he did show an interest in a boat that they then took over for further investigation. And um, they did, I don't believe they found any adult villagers, but the last boating place that that gentleman had been was an infested lake. So, so we are absolutely seeing the real world results that we are hoping to see. Well, let's put it this way. We always knew our dogs could do this, but now the research is proving that our dogs doing what, we, what we've said they've been able to do. Yeah, that's really great. Um, very exciting. All right. Um, I think we're we're almost at the top of the hour, so I am going to go ahead and close us out. Um, so thank you everyone so much for taking the time to join us. Um, as you know, the webinar was recorded. We will make it available on our YouTube channel um, where you can also find all our previous webinars. Um, and Carly's gonna put that link um, as well as a couple others in the chat. Thanks, Carly. Um, also, you can check out our case study dashboard where we, where we have 178 uh, published case studies. Our next webinar will be on April 4th. This one is given by Gregor Hamilton from the University of New Mexico, who will be speaking about invasive crayfish in the Gila River Basin. Um, so if you would like to join our mailing list, um, if you weren't on there already, please just contact us and we can get you on there. So thank you all again for your time and thank you especially to Debbie and Matt for joining us and giving us this excellent presentation and we hope to see all of you soon.